Thank you for visiting this video of St. Luke United Church of Christ in Beecher, Illinois. I'm Tom Ewing, the pastor here. This video contains the focus scripture lesson and the message that will be delivered later this morning at 1015 in the sanctuary located at 725 Penfield Street. The service will be recorded and placed on our church's YouTube and Facebook pages and should be available by mid-afternoon. We hope you can join us in person later this morning, but if not, thank you for spending time with us on the internet. Our focus scripture lesson this morning is from the 19th chapter of Luke, verses 28 through 40. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at a place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road, and he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. It's been a while since I started off a sermon with a really bad joke. I know what some of you are thinking. The only kind of joke you've ever heard me tell is a really bad joke. Well, here goes again. A dog walked into a Dodge City saloon and ordered a root beer. The barkeep snickered, We don't serve dogs, and we don't sell root beer in this saloon. The dog said, I've got money, and my money is as good as any man's. Give me a root beer. The bartender was tired of talking, so he reached under the bar, pulled out a gun, and shot the dog in the foot. Now, the bartender, said the bartender, get out of here and don't ever come back. A week later, the dog came back, this time wearing his gun belt that holstered two guns. Not seeing the man who shot him from behind the bar, he walked up to the new bartender, looked him squarely in the eye, and said very, very slowly and very deliberately, I'm looking for the man who shot my paw. <clears throat> I warned you it was a bad joke. <laughs> How about another? Irish comedian Hal Roach explains that not only are some of his countrymen quite devout, but they also take written instructions quite literally. One Irish friend, he explains, while visiting New York City, used the subway system rather late one night. As he exited his train and walked toward the escalator, he spotted a sign that said, Dogs must be carried on the escalator. Pausing for a moment, the Irishman was quite distraught. He thought to himself, Where in the heck am I going to get a dog at this time of night? <laughs> I should have stopped when I was ahead, shouldn't I? How many of you are dog owners? How many of you are cat owners? How many are both? We have some gluttons for punishment, I see. Author C.S. Lewis owned a dog of which he was very fond, and he used that dog to explain in non-theological language about the Incarnation, why the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He described the Incarnation this way. Lying at your feet is your dog. Imagine for the moment that your dog, and every dog, is in deep distress. Some of us love dogs very much. If it would help all the dogs in the world to become like men, would you be willing to become a dog? Would you put down your human nature, leave your loved ones, your job, your hobbies, your art and literature and music, and choose instead the intimate communion with your beloved, the poor substitute of looking into a beloved's face and wagging your tail, unable to smile or speak? Christ, by becoming man, Lewis explained, limited the thing to him that was the most precious thing in the world, his unhampered, unhindered communion with the Father. St. Paul explained the same concept of the word becoming flesh in much loftier language in another lesson for the epistle lesson for today, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. In that it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used by his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. 
and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a beautiful passage of scripture that explains the price Christ paid to become a human being. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's an old spiritual that puts it this way. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. All nobody else could walk him for him. He had to walk it by himself. There was no other way that the eternal God could experience the meaning of what it is to be human without taking upon himself the flesh of humanity. What an astounding journey Christ made from the celestial palace of heaven, as it were, to the shame and degradation of Calvary's cross. Or St. Paul put it in another place, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Can you get your mind around that? The blameless son of God didn't just take our sins upon himself, he became sin. He became utter shame, utter hopelessness, utter despair, that we might be made right with God. That means he takes into account the hills and the valleys we have come over and through because he has walked them too. That is the most preposterous and at the same time the most profound and the most potent statement that can be made about the Godhead. Christ walked where we walked. Christ humbled himself to become as we are, so that he might become as he is. Think of the journey he took to identify with even the humblest of people. It began with his birth. A young girl not yet betrothed is with child. We know that it was by the Holy Spirit, but the neighbors did not. Later we see Mary and Joseph, strangers in Bethlehem, herded like they were cattle to pay homage and duty to the throne of Rome. There lies the infant Jesus, born in a stable, laid in a manger. No earthly king was this humble man. For most of his adults' year, he worked with his hands as a carpenter. He was 30 years old before he began his public ministry, and immediately he was re rejected by his own townspeople. He was ridiculed by the religious establishment. He was persecuted by both civil and synagogue authorities and then put to an excla exclamation on his rejection. At the end of his life, he was scourged by soldiers and finally hung on a cross between two thieves where he died. Even one of the thieves heaped scorn upon him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us, he cried. Christ experienced all the scorn and abuse that goes with being a member of the lower rung of society. And here is the glory of it all. It was all for you and for me. Geraldine Wolfe, the retired Episcopal Bishop of Rhode Island, once spent a month living with the homeless people on the streets. Her reasons for making this dramatic choice were twofold. She wanted to better understand the needs of the poor and powerless in our society, and she wanted to distance herself from the pettiness of church politics. While living on the streets, Bishop Wolfe visited a number of Episcopalian churches, yet none of her own clergy colleagues recognized her. The bishop, the head dignitary of their local church was right in their midst, and they never saw past her homeless status. Bishop Wolf was but walking in the footsteps of her Lord, lowering herself that she might appreciate how others in less fortunate circumstances get by. Rarely do we see people at the top of society lower themselves to be the level of those at the bottom. We're told that when Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany went to visit Jerusalem, they tore down part of the wall at the Jaffa Gate so that the Kaiser could enter without passing under an arch. Such does this world accept royalty. But the King of Kings stooped to our level. In the second place in Christ, we see a love that is always reaching out to the least and the lowest. Jesus' actions on the cross were consistent with his entire life and ministry. He had taught, love those who persecute you. And on the cross, he prays for those who put him there. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. 
When one of the thieves says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus answers him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. His whole life was a testimony to a love that reaches to the least and the lowest. How the world needs that kind of love today. I wonder if you know the story of Star Daly, said to be the most notorious criminal in England in the early 1900s. One source described him like this. He wanted to be the kind of man who walked into a town and even the police shuddered in fear. So he embarked on a life of crime. Daly's career as a hardened criminal is said to have started as a small boy in a school classroom. His teacher had called him to the front of the room to read a simple passage. This timid little fellow shyly stumbles to the front of the room and attempts to read the assigned lines. It was another one of those humili humiliating experiences that happens in everyone's life. Little Star Daly began to stumble in his reading, and somehow the words ran all together. The harder he tried, the worse it got. The other children began to snicker, then to giggle, giggle, and finally there was open laughter in the room. He looked back to his older sister for support. His parents had died some time before. His sister was the last person left to care for him. With hurt and humiliation, he looked back at her for support, but she too had her head buried in her arms, laughing as hard as anyone in the room. He turned to his teacher, but she was obviously doing all within her power to keep a straight face herself. Little Star Daly was crushed. Any other child might have found this to be a growing experience. Little Star, however, exploded with rage. He slammed the book shut and threw it against the wall with all of his might. He ran to the door. Opening it, he shouted at his classmates, You will fear me, you will hate me, but never again will you laugh at me. He ran from that classroom, from that school, and from that town. In his teens, he became a major criminal, moving crime to crime and jail to jail. For four decades, he pillaged and killed and terrorized innocent people. Later, he reformed and became a model citizen. But what a difference it might have made if someone had reached out in love to that child before he went wrong. We know that Jesus would have reached out to him. His entire life was one of demonstrating unending love to the least and the lowest. He was a love forever reaching out. But one more thing, his was a light that has for all time overcome the darkness. Darkness and light are favorite images in the scriptures, as you know. When Jesus was crucified, there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. The imagery is clear. Jesus is the light of the world and that light was being snuffed out. Not forever, of course, or our lives would be forever hopeless. There's an old story of a young man dying in the battlefield and he asks for a chaplain. Give me a light, chaplain, he says. And the chaplain finds a cigarette and starts to put it between the boy's lips. And the young man whispers, no, no, chaplain, the other kind of light. The chaplain reaches into his pocket and brings out a New Testament and begins to read, I am the light of the world, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have a light, the light of life. That's it, that's it, whispers the young soldier as he lapses into unconsciousness and death. It appears for a while that darkness will prevail on Golgotha that day, but of course it does not. The darkness can never prevail over the light. Sin and death, which darkness represents, have been defeated. Later, St. Paul will write, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But it is more than the sting of death that Jesus has overcome. It is the sting of shame, the sting of humiliation, the sting of rejection. So, your life is filled with hurt and bitterness and disappointment. He understands. He cares. He offers a new beginning. He offers a light that overcomes the darkness. As we celebrate this Palm Sunday, as we celebrate the joyful procession and the cheering crowds, let's acknowledge that Jesus' life was not always that way, just as our life is not always that way. His was a life begun and ended in shame. His was a love reaching to the least and lowest. But more importantly, he is the light that can lead us from the darkness of shame and rejection and to the bright day of hope and wholeness once again. If your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in 
in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Until we meet again, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Amen.